Eddie has been in Forbes, Inc., Business Insider, The Economist, and Progressive Grocer. And now here he is on Legends and Losers. <laughs> well, and, and, and so the, you, you talked about marketing beforehand and uh, changing the positioning. What they did was they changed their marketing from, let me tell you about the kilowatts, all the technical specs, right? To testimonials. They, they told stories about people like preppers. And when other people who were potential preppers thought of that and heard that, they're like, oh, I get that. That's me. I'm going to go do this now too, right? And so it's the whole mindset of, and I don't know if you see this a lot in, in the Silicon Valley area of like, um, you get so much farther in marketing and creating your new category, not by talking about what you did and how hard it was to make it, but you know, that story and that testimonial of why it makes your life better in a life hack uh, kind of way there. Yeah. Particularly when it's, the whole story, so to speak, is um, put inside of the context of a framing of a problem. Yes. yes. Right. So if you think about the concept of a point of view or POV for short, right? Yeah. We frame a problem. We yeah. evangelize the shit out of that problem yeah. and the solution becomes obvious. And to your point, Eddie, what we've seen as an incredibly powerful marketing device is, you know, the company can do that. Mm -hmm. But if they let their, you know, the mistake we see people make with testimonials is to your point, they have the customer who's doing the testimonial have a, a features discussion. Yes, yes. As opposed to a POV discussion, which is before the generator, oh, it was horrible and there was locusts no. and it was, I had things growing on my ass yes, and it, life right. was terrible. And then I, I bought the generator and ho. Oh, right. right? And so it's this, you have the customer frame the problem in the way That's you right. framed. And they become the evangelist for both the problem and, of course, the solution, which is the category. Yeah. 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 100%. And so if I'm doing category design, what I hear you saying is find out who the 10% are yeah. in the existing space who are the super consumers. Mm -hmm. Hang out with them. Understand them. And not mm -hmm. just your customers, your prospects, people you've yeah. lost to the competition. Yeah. Uh, people in the consideration phase, uh, look to see if there's clusters of geos of them. Yep. And then begin to mine for insights around what they're doing, what they're passionate about, maybe new use cases that you hadn't thought of per the yes. discussion. And that's by mining the insights of super consumers, I can then see how to either A, expand category potential, mm -hmm. or B, uh, tilt the category, reframe the category to my advantage. Is, is that what I hear you saying? Yes, yes. And I, and I think it's you really laid it out well. And I, I think in part, um, uh, don't be afraid of the windy roads that they may lead you down, right? Because I, the first part that you said is important of don't talk to your own customers, talk to the category customers. But then this whole notion of, um, you know, for Generac, their best CRM data might be sitting in some life insurance or some refrigeration company's data set, right? And so that when you see that consumer mission is so big and broad, your category solves a piece of it, but they're also using other categories to create a team, as it were, to solve what they're doing, is that your investigation can be start in your own category. If they lead you down some other random category you hadn't thought of beforehand, talk to those super consumers and mine that data because, you know, in, in my thought is you know, reading your guys' book is this, you know, category design, it's a lot of times begging and borrowing from other random categories and creating it together in a new way. I mean, it doesn't have to be, you're literally creating a new element on the periodic table. It's I've recombined two things and smashed them together in a way that made sense. Well, and I'll share with you one of my current favorites uh, just recently announced. It's, it, it's such a simple idea, but it's pure genius. So you might have seen this, Eddie. Uh, there's a, an announcement that came out recently, and I'm going to read you this headline from Business Insider. Quote, Netflix has a potential billion-dollar opportunity that it's just starting to explore. And uh, the article goes on to say, Netflix has a potential standalone billion dollar revenue opportunity. Translation, expanding category potential. Right. You ready for this? Selling merchandise based on its popular shows, according <laughs> to RBC's Mark Mahaney, who's a Wall Street analyst. Yeah. Is quote, we view this as a highly reasonable step by Netflix yeah. to further promote and market its original content and other offerings. And so 
you think about how simple that is, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to sell, you know, coffee mugs that say instead of Ramones, you know, orange is the new black. Yep. Yep. And now they've expanded materially their category potential. But if you'd said, hey, Netflix is going to get into the business of selling, you know, T-shirts and mugs and whatever other shit, you'd go, yeah. how stupid, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what I love about that, is that RBC report is um, I had a conversation with um, the CEO of Sony Home Pictures Entertainment, Manjit Singh, and what he would describe is... It, it, <laughs> There's so much more footage of a movie that obviously ends up on the cutting room floor, right? And that um, the same love of someone who, you know, is going to binge watch Orange and the Black and wants to buy an Orange and the Black mug. If you were to go back and get all the edited footage that didn't make it and you were able to create it into some sort of new offering, right? Like my wife, like her favorite thing is after a movie is to watch the extras with it, right? And so the ability to monetize extras, which is like stuff that people spent money on and it's, it's considered waste. I'm not going to do anything with it. But if you can identify, and there are not, maybe not many of them that want this, but there's a handful, a million orange and the black super consumers who would die and probably pay a nice premium for all the stuff you were throwing away. That's when you create a new market there, right? Yeah. And, and now they're in the trinkets and trash business. And yep. the, other thing, the other thing that's sort of interesting about that in the context of super consumers is who are going to be the first buyers of those t-shirts and coffee mugs and all the shit. Yeah, absolutely. Super consumers. Absolutely. And 100%. so you've now given them an emblem to walk around and, and, yep. and say, I, I've identified myself as a super consumer. Right. And, and, and I think if the, the other part that if you, and we can keep riffing about this all day, is that the big problem that Netflix is creating as they're solving problems is Netflix, Amazon, HBO, all the networks is, hey, you guys are creating too much content. It's overwhelming. And like HBR has the same issue of part of the reason why they scaled back from a lot of issues to fewer issues was that their magazines were piling up and then people started to feel guilty because they couldn't keep up with it and stuff. And I think the same thing is happening on the TV and movie front is like everybody's talking about X, Y, and Z. I cannot keep up. And if you have a bunch of super consumers out there curating, you know, obviously they're consuming stuff, but evangelizing product, then you can say, hey, I see Colin wearing orange and the black t-shirt. I know that the stuff that he likes, I probably like too. That makes it easier for me to figure out of the 12 shows that I'm, I feel like a loser because I haven't been watching, keeping up on, where do I go next with it there? And there's another dot in my head I'm connecting. Uh, we recently had the legendary Brian Kramer on who you mm -hmm. might recall his book, Shareology and yep. the sort of father of what he calls H2H, human to human. And, and, um, and so the dot that's in my head, maybe an obvious one, is if I want to create uh, digital marketing that's yeah. highly viable, 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 Colin, viable. It's, it's, a mix, it's, a mix, word. it's a new word. It's a mixture of viable and viral. It's viral. Viral. I like it. That's highly, great. Highly viable. Um, then what I'm hearing is create some awesome, highly viable, uh, shareable content. And don't go sh shotgun that thing. Yeah. Target it right at those super, those sm that small percentage of super consumers. Yeah. And the other one that's sticking in my head, Eddie, is get out of super consumers that are just your customers. It's yes. the super consumers in the category yes. who drive the thinking in the category. Yes? Yes, 100%. And it's, it's just funny. Like it's, it's, we live in a world now, to make your point, is that – um, too many executives think that the basis of competition is, you know, one product versus a, a like product or a like brand versus a like brand. No, it's, it's category versus category. And you're competing, you know, um, what Apple has done and rising healthcare has done has squeezed discretionary spending in a lot of other random categories there, right? I mean, it's, it's your, your telecom bill and your healthcare bill, you know, it, it's, it's just no longer that you can worry about the guy on the shelf next to you or the guy down the street from you. You know, your category has to be relevant because it, I, I think we would all agree here is that what you'll find is that some categories may not exist in a few years and you're fighting for relevance. And if you can't be relevant, you better darn well recreate it in a way that um, has legs for the future there. It's so interesting because, you know, in marketing, of course, everybody talks about branding. Yeah. And... My commitment before I die 
is that the world will understand that categories make brands, That's right. not the other way around. Yeah. yeah. Dell used to be hot, not so much. Great brand, great categories in the 90s, shit categories today. Yeah. Xerox, you know, there's a million you could name, right? Yeah. And, and so people say, well, I want, I want to build the, my brand. Yeah. Well, the, 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 the power of your brand is a direct function of your category. 100%. And if you're, if you're designing and building a category for which you have real potential to be the leader or category king in, yeah. it's being the category king in a legendary category that makes your brand legendary. That's right. Not the other way around. You, you That's right. the most legendary uh, you know, laptop manufacturer in the world. No one gives a shit about that, mm -hmm. right? Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. And, and, it, and it's just, it's, it's um, I think, I, I suspect why people resist the wisdom that you're just saying there is that it's scary and it's hard. But the reality is, is that it's too easy to copy what you just made. Um, it's, it's a more fragmented world to get your, your brand message out there. And you know what, like, it, it, it's just one of those where if you can't get this concept into your head, then, you know, you're playing um, checkers in a world of chess. Like it, it's, yeah. it, it's not going to work. Yeah. And so, and so what's your big advice for, for companies who, you know, you and I have talked in the past yeah. about um, how few companies really have the courage to go yeah. be category designers. Yeah. What's your advice, particularly in the context of super consumers, if, if I'm someone who wants to go design a new category that I can then dominate? Yep. So um, I would say three things. Um, go find two or three super consumers. That's all you really need. I mean, more is great, but like find one in your friend and family network, find um, uh, one in a super geo so that you know that area is hot and then find one that is, you know, that kind of cross category super consumer so that you, you've really covered your basis from an insight perspective. And you, you know, the whole notion of CEOs spend good ones, spend more time with their customers than in the organization. Like you should be spending a lot of your time with these three people and talking about ideas and this and that. And you know what? Um, just like, you know, uh, you can have a four hour conversation about rhino dinosaurs and the like and stuff like you know it, it's the same thing like it won't be hard to get them to engage that's number one so start those conversations and if you're not spending enough time with them then you're you got real problems i think the second thing is that um you should have a you know i don't know if it's the jerry Maguire mission statement but like on a piece of paper on a napkin it should be that simple um, a thesis or an idea for if you if money and resources were no constraint how would you double your category? You know, it's, it's a, it's a outlandish statement, but it's a very simple one of like, do you have a vision for, you know, could you double the number of people who shop the category by the category? Can you double the usage rate of the category? Could you double pricing the category? Like if you don't have a vision for how would you do that, then I would say your, your growth strategy without even looking at it, it's going to fail long term. Right. You might get short term wins, but if you don't, if you're not navigating towards, I know that there's loads more people who should be buying this that aren't. And therefore, I'm going to use super customers to do that. Or I know that I can convert, you know, uh, weekend wine drinkers into everyday wine drinkers. I mean, there, you could pick it, whatever it is. So that's have a category growth, double your category of vision that can fit on a napkin there. And then I think um, uh, and have those discussions with your supers. And then I think the third bit is you got to find the. Um, like-minded, you know, I don't give a crap rebels in the organization, you know, um, who, cause I, I actually, cause like when I think about my clients who've been the most successful, they're the ones who just didn't give, a, they didn't really care about the politics, about what was safe. They wanted to do the right thing. It was that missionary versus mercenary mindset. Find the missionaries in your organization and you should be convening off the record conversations with them about like, if we could redesign the category from scratch, what would it look like? And I think if, if and, and, you know, everything is on the table, like, uh, and, and frankly, the more conventional the wisdom is, the better. Like if you could flip it on its head, um, how would that actually look like there? Breakthrough product design, breakthrough business model design, change how we make money, all the kind of good stuff that's there. And if, you, if you're an executive or if you're an entrepreneur or if you're looking for money and funds or someone in the middle, 
if you do those three things, like you're having regular conversation with supers that'll help you sharpen what you do daily better every time, and you have clarity around, if you could, this is how you would double the category, and that you're convening this kind of off the books, you know, you know, insurgency with like-minded missionaries of, if you could just blow the whole thing up and start over, what would it look like? Um, you'll know you, you have basically three different moves that you can pull at any given time, given the right context and situations. Not every time in the marketplace is right for, you know, uh, doubling the category. So you, maybe you default to the first playbook, but it, in essence, it's like I got, I can, I can run the ball. I can pass the ball. I can, you know, do a play option. That's kind of what you need. And that's all you really need and play the right plays in the right situation. And you'd be in great shape to grow your business there. Eddie, what I love about what you're saying is when most people talk about getting market or category or customer feedback, they don't talk like you just talk. The way they generally talk is, you know, what three new features would you like? Mm -hmm. Or in a, in a sales situation, you know, you do, you do deal analysis and you want to understand why we lost this deal. And invariably what the mindset of a lot of people is, you know, what, what are the three features that were missing that caused us to lose this deal? What I think I just heard you say is, if you want to redesign a category or create a new category, mm -hmm. find the current supers yep. in the category, three to five of them, not a big number, yep. hang out with them. I heard you say, ask the question, how do we double this category? Yep. And, and, and have a, um, you know, to use a jargon, but have an ideation session, so to speak. Yep. Have a, have a as, as our friend Bix Bixen, who's been on Legends and Losers says, you know, have a hack the future conversation. Right. What's the future we want to have happen? Bring them into that discussion as opposed to the old Henry Ford. Well, if I'd asked my customers, right, right. they'd said right. they'd say have faster horse. Yes. Fantastic. That is fucking awesome. Now, hey, if we could just uh, maybe shift gears a little bit. Yeah. You know, you're one of the foremost thinkers in business. You're certainly one of the foremost mm -hmm. thinkers in, in category design, category creation, and growth strategy in, in, in consumer Fortune 500 world, right? Um, how does Eddie Yoon get to be Eddie Yoon? You're, you're, <laughs> you're born in Hawaii, then yeah. what happens? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no it, it's, it's um, you know, it, so my parents were immigrants from Korea, and, and I always thank them for making the choice of, of all the 50 states you pick the one that I'm the most happy with. So uh, I, they moved so, right before so I was born. You love Hawaii. I love Hawaii. So born and raised there. Um, Wh which uh, island? I was born and raised on, a, on Oahu. So on the east side of the island there. Um, and, you know, like um, uh, it, it, I got to Chicago uh, for college. And so I, you know, immigrant kind of blue collar oh, oh, family. Hold on a sec. So when you grow up in, on Oahu. Yeah. And then you show up to go to college in Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> What's that like? It, it was pretty terrible. <laughs> so, I mean, it was, um, you know, like I, I didn't think it's, it's funny when I talk to people who are sending their kids to college now and, you know, they're like, oh, you got to go on school visits. Like I'd never, I did no school visits. I'd never been to Chicago before. They, I, I went to the University of Chicago. They gave me the most financial aid. So I'm like, okay, I'll go there. So, um, and, and so I get there and uh, you, you guys will like this as Californians. Like there was a guy from Southern California that I, we were both like commiserating of how horrible the Chicago winter was. And literally there was a day in the fall, I was walking back from class and um, I'd never heard of daylight savings before. So I, I was like, you can't tell people don't change clocks. I'd never in, in my mind imagined that would happen. So we did that and it's dark at like four o'clock and it's a windy, cold day, and I'm walking under a tree, and it starts to hail. But my problem was I had no, never experienced hail before, and so I, I hear the hail first, like it's hitting the cars and this and that, and, it, it, and I feel it hitting me under the tree, and I think, this tree has some weird berries. Like, I don't understand what's going on. And I literally thought the world was ending because it, it, it's, it's a – scary thing if you've never experienced it before and it was me and this guy um, i mean you thought it was an apocalyptic biblical yes, yes. thing going on right i was looking for the zombies and the what was going on there coming that's right that's exactly i needed to find those those preppers and hide out there but um so it was a lot of firsts for me and i was homesick and it was you know the, the dealing with you know 
uh, perfect weather to unpredictable bad weather was a, was a tough one. But then, you know, uh, sophomore year and on, um, I really grew to enjoy it. Um, and then I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, but I, you know, I had an obligation to my parents for sacrificing all that they had. So I, my, my buddy was, Hey, let's do this. They, hold on. Thing. I, I hate to interrupt yeah. you, but it was a huge sacrifice for your folks to get you to college. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it was, it was, um, you know, what, what's funny now is, um, so we just got back from uh, spring break. We went to Korea, uh, and, and, and Japan with my family and I brought my parents and, like literally my parents went back to Korea for the first time in 40 years, like two years ago, and they're catching up with old friends and they're kind of at this interesting kind of juxtaposition of meeting their high school and college friends and saying, did we make the right decision moving to the U S or not with it? And, you know, certainly for, I would say for the last 35 years that they were here, it was like smart decision. Your kids are doing well, you know, all they're taking care of you guys are happy yeah and then now you know it, it, all the category design that's happening in, in korea now where lifestyle is pretty good um you know some of their friends are like mm, i don't know maybe it's a push like it could have gone either way with it and so i i felt a pretty big you know when I, when I look at my dad's friends and some of my mom's friends and you know when you look at the lives that they have now for them in Korea are better than the lives that my parents could have you know, had in the U S as an immigrant here. And so a lot of what I felt like I had to do was um, make sure that I, you know, honored what they had sacrificed and worked hard to pay. They might ask me to pay them back with it, but um, you know, that, that was part of my motivation and my narrative. And the thing that I worry about for my kids is that there's that, that, that kind of, um, you, you talked about the, the, the missionary mindset of I have to do this. Like, I yeah. had that. Um, I, I worry that my, I don't know what my kids will have because they live on a much more comfortable life than I did growing up, but um, we'll see. Here's my question about your kids. Yeah. In the school play, are they allowed to stand up on stage and read a cue card? Because <laughs> I just went to my niece's school play last Friday. Okay. And she's nine or 10. Yeah. And she has the lead role in the play. Yeah. She is Wendy in Peter Pan, or one of the yeah. two leads, right? Excellent. Baby Q is Wendy. Her name's Quinlan. Mm -hmm. So we go to this thing, and uh, two things happen that make me really angry. <laughs> <laughs> one of them is a number of kids are standing there reading the script on stage. Yeah, wow. And the world that I grew up in says, if you don't know your lines, <laughs> you're not in the play. Yeah. So that yeah. was the first one. And then the other one that drove me crazy was halfway through the play, unknown to me, another girl is Wendy. Oh. And another, <laughs> another kid is Peter Pan. And I'm like, what? I, this Equal was participation. I, I was wow. clearly not drunk. And so, uh, yes, this is what I find out. Everybody gets a role. Yeah. And I just look at those two things and I go, we are completely fucked up as a society yeah, because yeah. A, if you don't know your shit, you don't get to do the shit. Right, That's the right. world that I want to live right, in. Right. And B, okay, I'm okay with everybody getting in the play, <laughs> but you have to audition and the yeah. best kids get to be Wendy and the shitty kids get to be the tree. Yeah, yeah. And if you're the tree and you want to be Wendy... Yeah. You need to get your shit together. And, and Wendy, number two, with all due respect to her, was nothing compared to Quinlan. Yeah. And so I just look at it and go, what are we doing? Yeah, yeah. But I digress. <laughs> no. no, I mean, it, it, it's, I, I think it's a real issue, especially when these kids become adults and start looking for jobs and that the competition level is so much more brutal now. If you think about, hey, it's not about your product going obsolete. It's about your category going obsolete. Like, it, they're not being prepared for, you know, UFC level competition there, right? I mean, that's, that's right. The fear. Well, and the other thing that we don't like to tell children is that to, to your UFC analogy, one of the reasons Colin and I are huge UFC fans, I, you may have seen, we recently had Bruce Buffer. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. And, losers. and uh, anyway, uh, one of the reasons I love the UFC as a sport is two fighters go in. Mm-hmm. And one comes out, you're either a legend or you're a loser, <laughs> period. Yeah. And, and the, the reality is that that is the world, that, that is the way yeah. the world works. Not everybody gets a cookie, right? There is right. no participation trophy in life. Yes. Well, so and, how, and I think, how do you, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go, ahead, go ahead, Eddie. 
But I, I, mean, I, I think not only is there no participation reward in life, is it's, it's how undervalued adversity is in shaping so much of what's important to not only just being successful, but I think having the right perspective of whatever the circumstances are, that you have the tenacity and the grit to get through it, but also, you know, continue to invest in whatever you're doing with it. And so like, I, I just think that, um, you know, I, um, I, I worry about, um, for anyone, you know, and, and I've come to value and it's easy to say on this side of adversity is that it's, it's important, but how do you create or in, ensure that my kids and other people that you care about, like have enough adversity so that it doesn't break them, but you know, the right amount so that it sticks with them and it has a lasting impression on them there. Yeah. And as you were growing up and going to Chicago ultimately and so forth, what were the this word that Colin and I like to make up, what were the losery things that, that yeah. occurred in, in your, in your path that led to you being Eddie, the Eddie Yoon we know today? <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting um, where um, I had um, um, started out uh, at a smaller consulting firm and I was doing merger integration. And I, the, my first thing that I did for a few years was um the merger between Price Waterhouse and Coopers and Liburn. And, you know, I was 21, 22. It was great fun. Like the clients were partners from both organizations from all over the world. So every month we had a meeting in London and in Sydney and in Milan. So I was, you know, traveling the world, doing this really cool thing and learning how organizations work. And then right after we finished kind of stitching the partnership together and I felt really proud of the work, Sarbanes-Oxley happens and they're like, okay, no more consulting and audit together. And all of the work that I had done for the last couple of years was just torn asunder. And I was like, this sucks. I don't want to go through this again with it. And, and, and so in part, I was like, let me think about something different. And I had a colleague that left uh, to join Cambridge and that's where uh, she brought me along and was like, look, let's, it, it's kind of consumer facing. So it has more direct relevance and, you know, my parents will understand what exactly I do. Um, which is good. <laughs> big plus. It's a big plus. And, and, but also I think the, the growth strategy part was like, you know, of all the parts of business that you could kind of be associated with and be part of like, you know, I, I it, at least you got to shape the conversation that allowed two companies to come together or to, to move into this market before it kind of your work became uh, rendered irrelevant there with it. So I, I think that first kind of like, does my job have any meaning in life? <laughs> like experience led yeah. me to create a switch, which was really important. So you just didn't find meaning on that initial path. Well, it was, yeah, it was like, what was the point? Like I could have not done all of that and you know, they would have saved a lot of money and I would have been, you know, I, I, I still value the skills that I built on there, but like, you know, I, I was like, would I feel good doing a job that would have no lasting value or could so easily be rendered, you know, irrelevant that quickly with it? And so I think that search for purpose and meaning kind of let me, let me try something different. And I really liked the consumer work. I really like growth strategy work. And then uh, some years into doing it at Cambridge, um, uh, we were working with the then Sarah Lee company before it was bought by Hillshire and then bought by Tyson. And um, we had a great uh, thing going where we had um, uh, Steve Clapp, who was running it, and Carl Gerlach had uh, launched Ballpark Angus Hot Dogs to compete with Kosher Hot Dogs and $100 million innovation, doubled that business, and all that was going well. But then there was um, uh, one of the recommendations of the many that we did was around a high-end gourmet baloney as it were for in my mind it was now that that sounds like a, a, a tough new category to go for there yeah no I, I hadn't framed it as a category design but now that i think about it it was that and so it was what did um, you call high-end baloney was it <laughs> do you have a special name for it or yeah it would have been pure beef baloney um it would have you know tasted yeah, excellent with it and caught um you know, I mean, it, it would have met all these standards that you normally don't put bologna through, right? So you, you tr <laughs> basically treat it like a whole, like roast beef or turkey or chicken, like hold it to that standard. Boris had, uh, who was the market leader, had a version of it that was doing well. So we were like, why can't we play there too? And so we recommended it, they launched it and it didn't work. And then the CMO called me into his office uh, like a year later and basically dressed me down, was like, Hey, um, your recommendation sucked. 
it didn't work. We lost a lot of money and you should feel ashamed of yourself. And I spent- How um, old were you at the time, Eddie? I, I would have been in my late twenties, I think, or so. And so, I, so and I've been so doing it for really a just been working, you know, you're at the very beginning, of course, of your career yeah. and, 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 and in particular, this choice to focus on growth and consumers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it was um, still formative enough for me to say, again, another existential, why am I doing this if, you know, um, someone can say to me, you know, like, look, you took our money and you led us down a bad path and we lost money, you know, um, you know, you should feel bad about this. And I did feel bad about it. And I think to the point where I was like, well, shoot, do I want to be in consulting at all? And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, should I think about something different? And what it caused me to do was, um, just take stock of, I literally created a spreadsheet and I listed every project that I ever worked on. And, I, I counted the times that we got to a really cool insight, a really, I got the client to do something and the thing that they did actually made the money in the, in the marketplace. Right. And what I realized is um, for the third um, criterion, did they make money? It was about a third of the time is kind of how it happened. And so I said, well, good if I'm playing baseball, bad if I'm in consulting. Like I, and, I, and I don't know what other people's track records were, but I'm like, I, I got to get it at least better than a coin flip, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I, I worked really hard to figure out what was in common when somebody did get, you know, they made 10x what they charged, what I charged them, did they get that? And how do I ensure those characteristics really, you know, stick around with it? And so, I mean, those two experiences were really, um, uh, uh, formative that way. And then I think the third one that comes to mind is, um, excuse me, the, the, um, so before I, I was on the cusp of becoming a partner and I had two kids at the time and my wife and I were fighting about having a third kid and we were also fighting about who, who wanted one and who she, didn't. She wanted a third kid and she grew up in a family of three. I grew up just me and my brother and I was like, I, Hey, why roll the dice? We're doing great here. <laughs> so, 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 Eddie, let it. Let me guess who won the the, the debate here. <laughs> yes, I yes. can tell you that one. <laughs> I think everybody can guess. There. Do you yeah. have three children today, Eddie? <laughs> we have three children today. Um, but it, it was it was really um, stressful, and it's not. I mean, it's a stressful decision on its own. But the way that it was kind of happening at the time was. Um, third child or not, but also uh, go for partner or not with it, right? And so partner's kind of the pinnacle of what you would expect in consulting. And, and my wife's vantage point was like, we don't need the, you know, it, 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 our lifestyle is fine. Um, we don't have to chase, I'm not going to cause you to chase more and more and more. So why do you need this? Um, and if you do this, it's going to take you away from our family even more. And so it was really pitted my career versus being a good husband and a good father. And so she did win the children argument, which was great. And I'm very thrilled to have Luke around, of course, with it. But like, um, how old is Luke today? Eddie? Luke is nine. Luke is All nine. Right. So yeah, yeah. And um, you know, we have loads of fun together. Um, but you but also I, I went think for partner at the same time, right? So I how, did. How did you pull that off? Yeah. So, um, so what <clears throat> I concluded was, okay, uh, not every partner, uh, is the same. And so there are some partners that, um, you know, they, they're very good at what they do, but they're not quite established in the marketplace where, they have their own thought leadership and their own clients and their own platforms. And, you know, they kind of have to follow senior partners around. And I was like, that life sucks. Like I, I do not want to do that and be at the beck and call somebody else. And so what I said was, if I'm going to do it, I have to really go for it. And not just my goal isn't to make partner, but it's to actually create new ideas that um, have external viability and visibility what would you call it virability virability uh, external yeah, virability in the marketplace. New word. it's trending on twitter right now virability no, no i mean th that was actually it I, was, I i think it's i had to become a virable partner 
right? I had my own ideas that were externally validated that would allow me to have my own clients and call my shots and kind of be autonomous there with it. And it was like, go for broke or don't do it at all. And that's when I started to try to write for HBR. And it was, you know, I didn't know anyone there. And I had, um, we, we had a ghostwriter. So, so uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I hate to interrupt you, but Colin and I were talking a little bit before you joined us. You know, for me as a kid who got thrown out of school at 18, uh, of course, I didn't have any education. So I had to learn by doing, learn by reading, and learn by seeking out mentors. Yep. I remember, Eddie, very distinctly. It would have been somewhere around 19 or at maybe latest 20 mm -hmm. that I discovered the HBR. Mm. And it was like a, oh, you know, it was like a, <laughs> a it was a Moses tablets moment yeah. for me. And probably from about that time, 18, 1920, to certainly about 30, yeah. I would guess I probably read a quarter of everything wow. that HBR published through that time. Yeah. And I, I just couldn't believe it because for me, it was, it was a place to go yeah. to understand where the latest leading edge thinking was. And you know, I, I can remember when business process reengineering mm -hmm. came out. Well, guess what? I knew who W. Edwards Deming was. I knew mm -hmm. all about total quality control. I had gone and read those books. Of course, I had become steeped in, in Drucker because of yeah. the HBR and, and many others that I could mention. But I guess my point is that publication, like none other, mm. was really was the, the, the place for me yeah. uh, uh, in magazines. I read a lot of books too. Yeah. And um, when I was that age, the ultimate would be to have an idea that was worthy of publication in that, that magazine. Did you, did you, I, I gotta believe you held the HBR yeah. in, in that, was it, so tell, tell us a little bit, how was the HBR for you and what was it like when you first became, you yeah. know, one of the guys in HBR? Yeah, no, it, it's, it's a hundred percent. It's, it's um, the um, same level of esteem. I, I, I wasn't as early I should have, and I wish I was uh, jumping on it as you were describing it, but um, totally a lot of veneration for the publication and the brand. And whenever I was running into stuff that I didn't know how to do, which happens a lot in consulting, I would, that's where I would turn, right? And, um, and when I talked to Sarah McConville, who's the CMO there effectively, is like, she was like, there's loads of part of the reason why they charge what they can charge and the brand has such resonance is that people will say, I owe my career to some degree to HBR because when I had my back against the wall, they helped me get out of it and stuff. And so I, I felt exactly the same way. And then, you know, like I, I had the same dynamic of um, the, the one thing I think my parents are very happy with how my life has turned out and I'm glad that I've made them proud, but I never went back to graduate school. So I think they're still kind of disappointed about that because I, I just stayed in consulting. And so I, part of my rationale was like, you know, not only would it help my, my personal career and business plan to get into it, but maybe if I can get, you know, a small thing published in HBR, because, you know, it, Korean immigrants hold, there are few words that are held in higher esteem for a Korean immigrant than Harvard, right? And so, you know. Or in my case, a Scottish Canadian immigrant. <laughs> yes, yes, no <laughs> doubt. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of the great brands of the world, right? To your point, and, and partly because I think they've created new categories that haven't existed beforehand. And, and, and so um, I was like, this could be the, the, kill a couple of birds with one stone with it. And so, so yeah, held it in the same as veneration. I had no real belief that I could do it. And, and so I was like, well, partly, I think I have some cool ideas that I've learned over the years. And so let me just work to journal and crystallize what they are. And, and I, I think had I not had that kind of like, dressing down by that CMO about my high-end baloney thing that never worked with it, I would not have taken stock of my career. I would not have had the data journaling-wise to see, oh, there's a pattern of when things work and when they don't work. And that, that confidence of like, well, shoot, if you know, there are ideas that have patterns and have, have legs, and I've seen them work in the marketplace, that, yeah, maybe this is an idea that's worthy and maybe it's just a matter of figuring out, A, how to write and how to get it into the publication. So. You know, you, I, I'm reminded as you share that, Eddie, um, 
that a legendary thing I read, uh, an interview with Peter Drucker towards the mm. end of his life. And I think he was in his late 80s or maybe even 90s, but, you know, well into the game, so to speak. Uh, and the interviewer sort of said to him, Mr. Drucker, why do you keep writing and giving speeches and doing the things that you do? And he said, it's the only way I can know what I'm thinking. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, I love that. I, right? I love that. Yeah. 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 And so, yeah. I mean, you achieve something not only with becoming a partner and making a giant difference for so many Fortune 500 companies in, 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 in growth and category design, but, you know, so many people in business, this word thought leader gets thrown around mm. like crazy, right? Mm. You did the work to earn your place at HBR. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and what, what I'll tell you is that, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, I've encountered a lot of smart people, present company included, a lot of people who work hard, present company included, and the role that right place, right time circumstance has to play with it. Cause I, I'll give credit to the editor that I work with, Dan McGinn. Um, you know, I really lucked out because <clears throat> the very first piece that I wrote was actually about super consumers, but, um, I was working with a ghost writer who said, I have work with me. I have contacts at HBR. And that was the only way that I had knew how to get in. So I'm like, okay. And we iterated this piece over and over again. And, and actually I tried a couple of pieces beforehand and the editor that I first worked with had been there for years and you know, it's HBR. So you send them an idea like, Oh, we wrote about that 18 years ago. This is not new, which is the case with most business ideas is that it's not new. It's just maybe made new in this time. And it, I, I got one, that first super consumer piece published and it took so long and so much effort. And, you know, my, I always joke, like my wife is still mad at me because like on our wedding, um, she's like, what is this crap that you wrote about your groomsmen? And like, it makes no sense. You're not a very good writer. And so, <laughs> so when I was talking about writing for HBR, she's like, that doesn't make any sense to me at all, but whatever. So it, that first piece took a long time and I, I I'm, I'm so thankful that they took it. But then when Dan, Dan came aboard shortly thereafter, and he was um, outside of HBR, he was from Newsweek, and he had more of a traditional media mentality. And he was so kind to me about breaking it down for, hey, we get tons of articles about leadership and strategy and marketing. We're kind of short on these areas. Um, if you, here's the equation for <clears throat> making it work. And so... Um, he was the one who kind of gave me the, the, the code for what they were looking for. And I was more than happy to adapt what I had to do that. So we would turn out stuff. And um, so he's been great. And then, but it, it's been, I give him credit because I think he spent so much time editing my bad writing and that it's taken, it's, it's like, you know, you know, mixed martial arts or any discipline that Gladwell 10,000 hours, 10 years yeah. thing. But, you know, you, you mentioned an interesting thing, too, Eddie. We had um, the legendary um, venture capitalist, the gal mm -hmm. who's been named the most powerful woman in startups, Anne Mirako on. Mm -hmm. uh, and sh she shared her stories of the f that there was a handful of people, particularly early on, who believed in her, uh, mm -hmm. including um, uh, the CEO, of who, the guy who was the CEO of HP at the time, I think it was Lou Platt. Mm -hmm. But isn't it interesting how, to your point, we all have to work and then find ourselves in a position to get lucky. Yeah. yeah. And then don't, it's interesting how, you know, a lot of people when they talk about their success, they want to make it sound like they're self-made. And I have people yeah. who say to me, oh, it must feel great being a self-made man. And I don't have a relationship with myself like that because yeah. I know yeah. what the truth is. And the truth yeah. is I'm the farthest thing from a self-made man. Yeah. I'm, I'm a result of a lot of fucking help. And so I love to hear about Dan uh, being that guy for you, yeah. you know, or one of those guys yeah. for you yeah. because we all need those people, right? 100%. 100%. The other thing, Eddie, I have to thank you. Uh, I, I know we met online and I think, yeah. was it on Twitter or LinkedIn? One of those, I think. Yeah. Yeah. You, Maybe LinkedIn, did I yeah. reach out to you first? I don't remember who started this. <laughs> I, don't. I really don't. <laughs> we can't remember what we wrote. So who's you know, it was, yeah, the well, under on this one, but yeah. it was a lot of scotches ago, but right. here's what I do remember distinctly. However, we connected 
from pretty much the first connection, there was a openness and a warmth mm. that I experienced from you. And you and I, obviously, we've never even fucking met in person. Right, right, right. right. And, and as we started to share things, uh, it was very clear. It was sort of like the, the digital experience of the one we shared earlier about meeting Tim Rode on the on Right, the yeah, totally, totally. Like, totally. Oh, a brother in arms. Yeah. yeah. And you immediately were open and generous. So much so that you introduced us to Dan. And ultimately, we got to work with this great guy named Walter Frick. And mm -hmm. um, the HBR published... Um, some play bigger research, as you well remember, around the yeah. 610 law. And, awesome and stuff. Yeah. Th thank you. And that came out a few months before our book. And, uh, and then so there I was, I don't know, at the time I was probably plus or minus 45. And uh, we had done some work that the HBR deemed worthy, and they actually published our research mm -hmm. and our analysis of that research and both Al and I were quoted in the story. And when it came out, I had this experience of flashing back to being that 19, 20 year old <laughs> kid. Yeah, yeah. And I had this, this uh, uh, um, Colin, what's a backward deja vu? <laughs> That's a premonition. <laughs> it's a premonition. Um, but I just was transported when, when the physical copy of it came, mm. I was transported back to being that 19, 20 year old kid. Mm. And I almost had a, you know, I know how your mind does things. Yeah, I, yeah. I almost had this conversation with myself. Yeah. Anyway, I guess two things. Number one, thank you for that incredible mm. opportunity uh, to share our ideas in, 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 in that, that place, which is, I think Mecca for business ideas. Yeah. Thank you. It, it would never have happened without you. Yeah. And that leads me to a question, Eddie, which is so many people in business and particular, you know, in the kind of field that you're in, being a thought leader are very protective of their ideas, their, their relationships. Cause, cause you trade in a business mm -hmm. of intellectual capital and relationships. That's you tell me if that's the wrong way to think about yeah. it, but yeah. And so without really even knowing me, you open a door to one of the biggest doors and maybe one of the hardest doors in business journalism to get into. And, and on top of that, you're sharing intellectual capital, we're sharing ideas around category design and category creation and, and how compared, you live in the Fortune 500 world and we live in the Silicon Valley world and we're, all the things that happened when we first met and yet we didn't even know each other, we've never even met each other. So I guess my question in all that is, where so many have a closed mentality around things like relationships and intellectual capital, you seem to be exactly the opposite. How, why are you that way? Yeah, well, it, it, it's, it's very um, kind of this. And, and I think, I, think um, I had some inkling of the broader narrative, but I didn't know your whole backstory with it. And so I really appreciate everything that you said here. Um, the, you know, at some level, um, so I'll tell you, when we, here's what I remember. When we first met, and then and I'll get back to your question, and we started trading ideas, um, I had two kind of oil and water reactions of like, wow, this is really cool. To your point, another brother and tribe. And then my second reaction was like, man, that was the book that I wanted to write to. About. It was, and so um, if I'm honest, that was there in my mind. And when we started talking what what I concluded was like, you know, like I've written, I've done research in, you know, my, my world of consumer packaged goods and retail and media, whatnot, it's, it's fine. But like, you know, you know, Chris, Al, those guys, they're the real deal. Their research is better than what I have and their ideas are stronger and farther advanced than that. How stupid of me would it be to be petty about this and not share? Because I actually think that, um, like, I, I, I very quickly came to terms where you were so much farther along this thinking and actually had done it that it would be idiotic of me not to share and say, hey, you know, there's going to be a benefit long term for me to know these guys and learn from them and stuff. And so, like, I think that was so uh, not everything's altruistic. I did have that reaction with it and stuff. Um, and I, yeah. 
well, of course, I didn't know any of that yeah. until this second, of course. Yeah. Um, and that just makes what you did even more incredible in my mind because, first of all, thank you for all those wonderful things you said. The fact that you would say that about me and my you know, band of pirates and, and brothers yeah. uh, is, is incredible. Certainly the, the 19 year old me um, <laughs> would have never thought that a, a, a guy in your position would ever say that. So thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other thing is, how did you then, because I think maybe a lot of people or some people would have said, you know, fuck those guys and we're going to compete <laughs> and our book's going to come out faster and our book's going to be called play huger and, or whatever, <laughs> right? There's, there's all of that sort of natural human yeah. tendency when you meet someone and you go, oh, fuck, yeah. right? Yeah. What, what, what is it about you, Eddie, that you decided to do what you did, which was to embrace us. You're in our book. You shared our research. It's quoted in the book. You, I mean, you made our thinking better. You helped us understand how category design plays outside of Silicon Valley in a way that very few other people helped us with. And, yeah. and, and you were just so damn generous. Why did you make that decision as opposed to go right, play huger? <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's, it's, um, I mean, you know, the thoughts that come to mind to your question is, I think, um, what, what I so appreciate about your backstory is that, you know, when, when you come from, um, not much and not knowing that, you know, success is inevitable for, or, or even a possibility that, you know, I, I am, um, always thankful for what my parents have done for me, and always to your point of um, you know the mentors along the way. Like I, I have loads of them who didn't have to believe in me and did, and made all the difference in the world. So I, I think I, I I I have a general sense of debt I owe to many people, and um, so that kind of gratitude I think is is not always there, and I, I should you know be work harder to keep it top of mind, but I think that's part of it. Um, I, I had been writing about generosity, actually interesting, like in, in, in at some level, um, what I, what I, this is a little hokey, but what I believe about super consumers is that um, the real fundamental level is that super consumers are people who seem weird to others. And that my mission is to say, people aren't weird. They're just, a little farther along in some areas and you know that they're logical just like you and me and if you had respect and empathy for understanding what they are they might actually benefit you in some way shape or form right and that competition this whole pie splitting that's the wrong way to think about the world so and that making the pie bigger and collaborating and growing you know like this whole it had been you know it's in my heart from my growing up experiences of the people that i'm thankful to um, you know, like even my wife is a definite, I, I definitely traded up on that one versus, you know, not. So like all of these things I'm extraordinarily thankful for my, my, my brain was saying, you've been writing about this for ever and a half is that it's, you know, um, not just a values in a mission thing, which it is, but it's actually a better way to run a business is to be generous. And that I think the, the third bit is, um, you know, it's, it's this notion of, I, I do think part of my mission in, for my career is there's, there's two things is autonomy and apprenticeship. And, um, the, the, the partner that I wanted to be, I didn't want to be someone who didn't have autonomy because I had to follow other people because I didn't have unique ideas. So I wanted all of the things in my life I wanted are autonomy. And, and, and in order to do that, I had to be worthy of it. And I, I've been striving for that, but the apprenticeship is the, you know, part of consulting and working with loads of clients, but also, you know, learning from lots of people is the joy of getting better at stuff and by learning from other people with it. And that what, um, I mean, at, at some level in my, my strive to become autonomous was my ideas had to get better. And I always think of it like a Costco sample is like, Hey, plenty more where that came from. I'll, I'm <laughs> more than happy to give you a taste because if you like it, you'll come back for more. So I, I don't, I'm, I can be confident about doing that. But then like, I, I mean, I, I genuinely. And are you just like Costco in that if <laughs> I go to Costco with the sole purpose of having lunch as I go to all those tasters, that's yep. actually okay with you? <laughs> that is totally okay. That is totally okay. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, 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 um, I mean, 
it, it's it's an interesting because like I, I think I remember also reading um, this one thing of you know I'm not a linguist but like there's some sort of etymology root of generosity that's the same as generative and genesis like the beginning and creating and that this this notion of I have excess and I can give it away. Um, oftentimes come from a sense of gratitude or surplus of like, I, it's easier to do that if I feel like I got plenty or, um, well, someone did it for me, so I can, I have to do this now myself. But like, you know, I, I think for, I, it was a joy to, you know, you know every, everyone has mixed emotions, but it was a joy to do it in the sense that um, my career 20 years in, was outside of Silicon Valley. And, you know, to your point, there's a lot of moving and shaking that's done there, a lot of new thinking that I could apply. And I, and I think at some level, there's a one plus one equals 11 opportunity to take what I've learned in traditional consumer packaged goods and retail businesses and apply it vice versa there. And so my thought was, hey, this is as good of a chance as I'm ever going to get now to learn from other people with it. So why not jump on board with it? So I had no idea you thought about it at that level, um, but I want you to know, even though I didn't know it, I felt, I felt it. I didn't know that you were, you know, how, how much sort of what it was sort of frontal lobe versus, <laughs> you know, in the back of your mind, uh, intuition versus, you know, thinking about it. But regar regardless of how you were doing it behind the curtain for me, what I felt, Eddie, mm -hmm. was here's a guy who, you know, we had that instant connection with yeah. and I'm not sure why, but this guy is being generous like this. And so I'm going to play with him. Right. Mm. And, um, but I do want you to know I was and am blown away by it. I appreciate that. It's, it's not easy to say those things. And, um, it makes me, uh, no, I, I'm, I'm thankful for however we did meet and I'll, I'll go back and try to figure it out, but I'm thankful for I, that. I, I don't yeah. care if I yeah. tweeted or LinkedIn yeah. or I don't know what yeah. you or vice versa. I'm just glad yeah. one of yeah. us did it. I'm glad. hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. And then, you know, so if you think about your life now, I mean, you best-selling author, thought leader, guru to the fortune 500, really fortune 100, um, you know, partner, what's next for you? What's the future yeah. like for you? And, and, and also, of course, uh, you know, dad to three great kids and, <laughs> and, and husband to a woman who somehow you finagled into marrying you. <laughs> Absolutely. So wondering about that. Yeah. So yeah. as you think about the future and the next steps in your life, your family and your career, what's up for you? Yeah. So um, I, I think um, your Peter Drucker quote sums it up for me. If, if I didn't write, I didn't know what I would be thinking or what. Um, so I am actually leaving Cambridge and I'm going to start, I'm going to Airbnb myself effectively. And so um, uh, I'm going to try to do uh, a solo shop, I'm not trying to build a big enterprise, but like um, basically um, spend about a third of my time writing, a third of my time speaking and you know, kind of gathering stories and about growth and this and that. And a third of my time, you know, doing growth strategy with longtime clients or new clients that's there. And so I'm trying to scale back the consulting piece of it. Um, uh, because I mean, th there's too much stuff to read and to process and write and, and too much to learn. So I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm at a position, you know, there's momentum with the book, as you said, and, but also where, um, uh, I, I feel like it's a good time. My, my eldest daughter, Mia, is 13. So I've got five years left with her before she leaves. And with Luke being nine, like half of his time with me is, is, is done. So it's a good time for that. Um, uh, you'll appreciate this. Is, uh, so uh, the tentative working name of my new gig is um, Eddie Would Grow. So No way. Yeah. I love it. Yes. <laughs> Sir, me. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah so that's a great name. Now, do, do, you want, do you want to unpack why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is going to be called Eddie Would Grow. Yeah. If you're not a surfer, <laughs> I don't know why that's so legendary. <laughs> so um, it's it's um, uh, so I, I'm not a big wave surfer like you guys are, and but like this notion of we're not big wave surfers. <laughs> just so, I, I I am a legend in knee high waves. <laughs> 
yeah, yeah. So, so I think we're we're in the same camp there. So Eddie Aikau is, um, you know, an iconic what we call waterman in in Hawaii. So uh, famous lifeguard, you know, champion swimmer, but more importantly, big wave uh, surfer. And um, his story, actually, there's a great 30 for 30 about it was um, they were, there was the Hokulea, they were trying to recreate the Polynesian navigation by the stars. And so, you know, this crew of uh, Native Hawaiians and folks were going out on a, on, a, on a canoe traveling by the stars with nothing else from Hawaii to Tahiti and the rest of Polynesia. So as, as a lifeguard and big wave surfer guy, he went out. Um, they launched under not so good circumstances and ran into trouble shortly off and they were a number of miles offshore and rather than just wait, he decided to jump out of the canoe and swim for shore to get help and they never saw him again there. So I, I think for me, he represents, you know, um, courage to do great things and design new categories. Um, he represents uh, skill and expertise across a lot of different functions. But, you know, I, I think that same generous spirit is what I aspire to be like as well, too. And so hopefully the the Quicksilver guys and the, you know, whatever won't come after me with this. But like at, at some level, um, he moronic. <laughs> come on. It, it, it's, it's something that I have a lot of respect for. It's, it ties back to my growing up in Hawaii and anyone that I've ever worked with is probably sick and tired of me talking about Hawaii and while I'm going to, and how I weave those stories into what I'm going to ask them to do as a growth strategist. But um, yeah, I, I think that's kind of where my the inspiration is. And I think to your point, the way that I want to live my life and, and build my career in the next stage of it. And I think this kind of, um, uh, so Eddie would grow dot net is kind of where I'm, I'm building this out. And Colin, h- how great is that? I mean, is that the greatest move that Eddie could pull or what? <laughs> I, I'm very impressed. It's incredibly creative. And, um, and then there's the big wave contest named yeah. after Eddie called the, yeah, the Eddie yeah. I cow. Yeah. And, and yep. I wonder if you can find a way to leverage that each year and do an Eddie would grow contest. Oh, that's, that'd be, <laughs> I mean, you know that 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 be I'd have to reach back to you guys because that'd be if in the invitation only the best of um, category designers coming together to talk about it and stuff that'd be I, 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 we, I we, smell we, an idea brewing we we <laughs> would be mental if we didn't do and Eddie would grow something uh, you know there in on Oahu I mean we'd be yeah. crazy and and yeah. you know. Uh, for people who aren't, don't know, I mean, to Colin's point, the, the Eddie Akau at Waimea Bay is, um, some people would say, is the most storied big wave event in the world. Uh, you know, the folks who do Mavericks would probably have an <laughs> argument, but sure. I, I, I could give a shit. I love watching Mavericks and I love watching the Eddie. I don't give a shit. It's all awesomeness to yeah. me. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, how cool. How cool. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, Eddie, to hear you say that part of your motivation for doing this, or it sounds like a big part of your motivation, is where your kids are. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's, it's um, you know, to your point, there's the usual suspects of, you know, bad stuff that kids can get into. But I, I, I do think that it's, um, you know, like part of the unexpected benefits has been talking to the kids about my planning to do this you know, cause they're kind of like, does this mean we won't get to go to Hawaii, even though you're talking about Hawaii, like, you know, this and that. And, <laughs> and, and so, um, <clears throat> partly I think, um, as we talk about, you know, in a world of, you know, everyone participates and adversity is bad. Like, you know, my hope is that for them to see me do this and, you know, if it fails, it fails and I'll figure out something else from there. But like, I think to engage them in a discussion about, um, you know, this is uh, as much as you can and at your, you're at the um, behest of what life throws at you and you got to work hard that um, when you have moments when you can really go for it, then you really ought to try and it doesn't, the joy is in the journey. It's not just about whether you get there or not. And, you know, and, and I think also, um, you know, you know, the added benefit of um, getting to a place where you have 
some ideas that have some credibility and traction in the marketplace is I suspect this is where employment's probably headed anyway, is people who are good at what they do, being able to call their shots agnostic of whether they work for an organization. And, you know, I think seeing you do what you did too, was also inspiration of like, Hey, I can do this too, maybe. So. <laughs> Uh, well, and Colin's an expert in the gig economy. Yeah. <laughs> and it's interesting, this, co- this notion of the gig economy, this notion of solopreneur. Um, the, the thing that's cool about it, you, you've been at Cambridge, what, plus or minus 20 years? Is that? Yep. Yeah. About 18 years now. Yeah. yeah. And so how cool to say going forward, I want to be a solopreneur. Yeah. I'm going to steal that. I, I hadn't used that to articulate it, but yeah, that's exactly. Well, Eddie, uh, you are unbelievable, man. Uh, oh, this has been awesome. I love this. You are I fucking so much fun. Is there anything else you want to share before we um, before we uh, get to the end of this wave and kick out? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm grateful for the time. Um, I think sure if, um, if 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 uh, well, I'll, I'll um, ask Felix to reach out to you if if they have any more. Um, I'd love to see how the super consumer idea scales outside of my world of consumer packaged goods and retail and stuff. And so if, if your listeners and, and, and followers in the tech world want to come talk to me about what that looks like, I, I'd love to figure it out. Cause like, I think this journey as, as you're probably finding in the play bigger, I saw that Al was in Australia and this and that, like, you know, I, I never know where these ideas go, um, but that's so much fun. So I'm, I'm so excited to see how many other people find this idea relevant and helpful. And so, just love to keep the conversation going with it. So, uh, Absolutely. And I think the thing, oh, I know the thing that you'll find, uh, you know, I did a somewhat similar thing, which was I retired shortly after our book, Play Bigger, came out mm-hmm. and Dave and Al bless him, continue in the business. And um, one of the, you know, everybody thought it was crazy. It's like, well, you're not going to monetize your book. And you know, that wasn't never the point for me. The point mm-hmm. was about having the ideas in the world. Um, and, you know, to your point on generosity, I didn't even care that I got, you know, credited with the ideas. I want the ideas in the world. Anyway, yeah. um, the cool thing for me about retiring after it came mm-hmm. out uh, is I, I had the gift of time mm. and I currently have the gift of time. And so what that's meant around the ideas that I'm passionate about around entrepreneurship and innovation and, of course, category design and, and the fact that, you know, we are at an all time low in America with entrepreneurship mm. yeah. and you know, that to quote the big Lebowski, this aggression will not stand. I want to make a difference in that. Right. Anyway, having time allowed me to interact with people from around the world who were reading play bigger Mm -hmm. and to really center myself on, okay, in a post full-time work world for me personally, Mm -hmm. what did I want to do with my life? And, And I realized I wanted to spend a giant percentage of the, hopefully the next 50 years of my life, trying to make a difference in the area of entrepreneurship yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and I think category design makes a difference there. Anyway, so that's a long winded way of saying the cool thing for you now is as you step out of being a, uh, a partner and, and you, and you do uh, Eddie would grow, you'll, you'll be in a position to interact with people from all around the world who are reading super consumers. And at least for me, that experience, you know, when you get a LinkedIn or a tweet or whatever from yeah. somebody in Norway or to your point on, you know, Al just being in, in Asia. And actually, I talked to Al yesterday and he was sharing some of the, the, the things that have subsequently happened in Asia since he was there. Mm-hmm. And you just think, well, OK, so the number one venture capital firm in, in, in Australia is now centering on category design mm-hmm. and, you know, uh, what's going on in Singapore and how the idea is really lighting up there. And, and our friend Daryl Dickens, who's, who's mm-hmm. centering his business on category design there. And there's all this stuff happening. It's like, yeah. oh, and, uh, Legends and Losers, we just had Paul Maher on and he's, mm-hmm. he started a category design practice for his, his firm and all this stuff. Anyway, my point in it is, you will have the opportunity like I have had because you'll have the time to be, you know, slow rolling Eddie would grow Mm -hmm. to interact with people from around the world and and share, share the ideas and the research behind super consumers. And, and um, you're going to be awesome at it Uh, (laughs) from your lips to God's ears. So yeah. (laughs) And you know, you might want to think Eddie, you might want to think about a podcast. I mean, you're incredibly articulate. You're, here, uh, you 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 have a face for for YouTube. Oh, like wow. I, I I have a face for <laughs> iTunes. Uh. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, it's I I hope this is the start of many conversations because I I'm a huge podcast super consumer and 
you know, again, I um, can't thank you guys enough for having me on and I, and, and everything that I've learned from you, Chris, and I will pick your brain, Colin, about the gig economy. But like, I, I think that's the best part about all of this is um, meeting cool people who you're more than happy to be generous with because you get 10 times back. So thank you. Well, we love you, Eddie. I'm, I couldn't be more excited about your future. Uh, Colin, anything else you want to add before we uh, kick out of this wave? I just want to say how awesome it was. It was such a great morning. Thank you so much for coming on, Eddie. Oh, thank you very much. I had super fun. So. We love you, Eddie. We love super consumers. And uh, <laughs> let's talk soon. And we should do some evil planning on Oahu. Hey, I, there it is. There it is. I'm with be, you. Be legendary, my friend. Thanks. Thanks. Take care. Wow. There he is, Eddie Yoon. Thanks, Eddie. Um, if you like this episode, you will love episode eight with the legendary venture capitalist, Mike Maples, where we talk about the networked economy and how the future of business and the economy is wrong and, um, and what the future of the economy is. Incredibly important and insightful uh, discussion about abundance and platforms and networks and all sorts of good shit. Um, also, we'd love it if you subscribed on legendsandlosers.com, iTunes, Stitcher, and YouTube. We always love your reviews. Uh, we'd love it if you joined us on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash legends and losers. And if Twitter is your thing, at legends losers. And if you want to get a hold of us directly, send email to blackhole at legendsandlosers.com. And, um, in completion of today's show, we would like to thank Equity Directory, the invite-only network of entrepreneurs and talent exchanging work for equity. OneLifeFullyLived.org, dream it, plan it, and live it. HarperCollins, instant classic, play bigger. How pirates, dreamers, and innovators create and dominate markets. NetSuite, Number one in cloud ERP, come out and see us on the NetSuite Next Ready business tour. Our good friends at Spiro, the sales app for salespeople and sales managers who like to make money at Spiro.ai. MSF, or known better here in the excited states as Doctors Without Borders. You send us a donation and we will help the people in the worst parts of the world. Our good friends at 800 CEO Read. Hey, business books, don't be a loser. Read something. 800 CEO Read.com. Super Consumers, the smash hit new book from Harvard Business Press by our guest and friend Eddie Yoon. Pick up a copy. WWF, the World Wildlife Fund. Animals are people too. Uh, our good friends at Fathom, the legendary digital marketing firm at FathomDelivers.com. Interview Valet, the leading podcast interview marketing agency, and uh, my official agent for booking me on podcasts. Uh, thanks, Kara. Thanks, Tom. While we're on podcasts, our dear friends at Pursuing Results, producers of legendary podcasts, and this one, <laughs> The Marketing Journal, good shit to read from Hart Hanks. Scotch, if it's not scotch, it's crap. A Spectacular Catastrophe and Other Things I Recommend, the amazing new book from our dear friend and guest, Dushka Zapata. And the beautiful town of Santa Cruz, California. Hey, come here on vacation if you like Great White, Shark Great <laughs> Great White Sharks. They say that, Great White Sharks. They'll eat you in Santa Cruz. Today's information is provided to you solely for informational purposes. This podcast is a sole property of the Legends and Losers Oddcast Network, and we'd love it if you shared the shit out of it. We also need to warn you, this oddcast is produced in a studio that does contain nuts. Support your local category designer. Listen to the Ramones. Watch the Big Lebowski. Hey, Dandy Candy, we love you and thank you. Do not pour hot coffee on your crotch. It's okay. Go ahead and pee in your wetsuit. Don't forget, Legends and Losers makes you sexy. Tell two friends you love about two podcasts you love. And uh, don't dry your pets off in the microwave. And hey, Colin, this oddcast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Our deepest apologies go out to SAP CEO Bill McDermott. Sorry, Bill. We just ran out of time for you. That's it, my legendary friends. We'll see you again soon on another episode of Legends and Losers. <laughs>